Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's session um, entitled Our Body, Let's Talk About Breast Health. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Menahan. I am Professor of Nutrition and Genetics in uh, Norwich Medical School, University of Anglia, University of East Anglia uh, in Norwich in the UK. And I'm also Director of uh, Norwich Institute of Healthy Aging, which is very focused on how our behaviours, uh, things like nutrition, physical activity, smoking, alcohol, socialisation, etc., influence our health and well-being. Um, tonight we're broadcasting from Norwich Research Park, where Norwich Institute of Healthy Aging is based. It's a great place to work, um, and we do uh, a lot of high-quality biomedical research from the fundamental lab-based research right through to applied research which influences consumers and patients health and well-being as i mentioned uh, the topic of tonight's series of talks is breast health and breast cancer breast cancer in uh, affects one in seven of us women in our lifetime the very good news though is these days survival rates are five year survival rates are extremely high. They, they sit at about 90%. And the reasons for that are our ability to diagnose and precisely diagnose breast cancer is greater than it's ever been. And also the range of drugs and other therapeutics we have to treat breast cancer when it occurs is, is improving all the time. And actually, two of the talks you will hear tonight will be on those very topics. The first one on uh, the use of AI in breast cancer diagnosis, and the second, innovation around new drugs to treat breast cancer. Also, uh, there are many ways to reduce breast cancer from happening in the first place. Uh, through altered behaviour, through improved nutrition, through being more physically active, etc. And that's another very big area of focus for us in Norwich. Uh, we know our behaviour affects our gut health, and we're increasingly begin to, beginning to appreciate that our gut health affects our breast health and breast cancer risk. And actually, our last talk tonight will be on that topic, the association between our gut microflora and our breast cancer risk. So tonight, overall, you'll be joining us to explore the use of AI in, in mammograms, looking at a metal-based drugs as a new treatment for breast cancer, and the final talk, as I mentioned, will be how our gut and our gut microflora may influence our breast health and our, our risk of breast cancer. So you're very welcome, and I really hope you, you enjoy our three talks, which I'm sure you will. So... Um, I will move straight on now to introduce our first speaker, who's a, a, a colleague of mine who I've worked with over the years, um, Dr. Lisa Crossman. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, Lisa is a visiting worker at the Quadrum Institute and an honorary senior lecturer at UEA. Um, she does a lot of work on sequencing of microbes uh, through the company sequenceanalysis.co.uk. Lisa previously worked at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge, um, again, sequencing DNA and, and looking at microbes which cause disease. And in the last two years, Lisa has gone back to the future to study artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that's going to be what she's going to talk to us tonight. So, Lisa, over to you. OK, well, it's great to see you here, everyone. And it's very kind of point of science to invite me here. So um, I'm originally a biologist and I've been programming since 2013 and studying AI for the last two years. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So you might have seen some tweets about um, this quiz and to kick things off for us all, uh, thought you could have a go on this quiz. If you haven't already had a go, uh, you can use this QR code to um, take part. And we'll look at the results at the end. So you might be wondering exactly what is artificial intelligence? Well, artificial intelligence first came about in the 1950s. And it was defined quite broadly as compute systems able to perform tasks normally requiring human intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of AI. So all of machine learning is AI, 
but not all AI is machine learning. And machine learning is defined as compute systems able to learn and adapt without following explicit instructions to draw inferences from patterns. So we can see from that that AI that's not machine learning is going to be an algorithm that follows a set of strict rules, like an older email spam filter, which follows a set of rules to assign scores, which add up to give us a label of spam or not. But machine learning is different because it's something that learns without a book of instructions. Now, deep learning is again a subset of machine learning and perhaps more obviously defined as using deep neural network layers. So classical machine learning that's not deep learning actually requires less data, but more pre-machine learning feature engineering or getting data into specific types before use. But it can be cheaper to run and interpret. Um, one example might be a lone decision uh, computer and also newer spam filters that can learn from experience. So deep learning is deep neural networks. We're going to speak about them from now on, but we should remember that they need a lot of data inputs and they can be expensive to run and sometimes affected by biases. So you might have heard of the Turing test, which was put forward by Alan Turing in the 1950s, and he's recently made it onto our 50 pound note. Let's hope we get to see one of those. And the Turing test is designed to identify machine intelligent behavior. So during a Turing test, the human questioner asks a series of questions to each of two respondents, uh, one of which is a human and the other is a computer. And after a specified time, the questioner tries to decide which terminal is operated by the human and which by the computer. And this is passed if a computer is mistaken for a human more than 30% of the time during a series of five minute keyboard conversations. And this was first passed in 2014 at a competition organized by the University of Reading. And the AI was posed as a 13-year-old Ukrainian called Eugene Gustman. It was also uh, potentially passed in 2017 when the Google duplex assistant booked a hairdresser appointment without the hairdresser realizing she was talking to a device. So now we're commonly interacting with smart speakers such as Alexa, Siri, and Google Home. And although they're very intelligent, they weren't designed to pass a Turing test to fool a human in that they will fetch you endless complex information from the web, tell you the weather forecast, to carry out difficult calculations in the blink of an eye. And if you've ever done a capture where you have to click boxes with street lights or cars or crossings, that's a type of reverse Turing test where you have to prove you're a human. So in our back to the future scenario, 1955, was the year that AI was coined as a term. And that was in an invitation to a conference called the Dartmouth Summer Research Project. And that's widely believed to be the founding of AI as a field. Now, the first neural network was built by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957. And uh, this spaghetti-like um, construction that he's got here is his perceptron. And this was capable of a binary classification of data, dogs or cats, from a set of pictures. And you can see here that if you draw these pictures out of dogs and cats on a graph, then what his perceptron was actually doing was working out where you could draw the line on the graph between dogs and cats to identify which is which. And this line is known as the decision boundary. And that is what machine learning is working out how to do, how to draw the decision boundary. But it's not always quite as simple as a straight line and it can often be quite complex. So uh, deep learning neural networks are based on the operating principle of a biological neuron. And the neuron takes inputs from these structures called the dendrites. The weighted sum of the inputs occurs in the cell body and the neuron or nerve is fired if the total strength of the signal received exceeds a threshold limit. And uh, here are the outputs here. 
And this principle is applied to the deep learning neural network. So in the simple neural network, inputs are received as weights by a node where they're summed and passed through an activation function to create the outputs. And the weights are the strengths of the connection or how much influence the out input has on the output. And each network needs to be trained on the data of interest, such as an image, a bit like in the way we go to school, which alters the weights across the whole of the network to create better outputs. So you might be wondering, why are we only hearing about this now if it's been around since 1957? So why have they returned to the present? So this really was kicked off in the late 90s um, by the companies Sony and latterly uh, NVIDIA as they got into the gaming space and they built uh, GPUs. And the term GPU or graphical processing unit was coined by Sony for the original PlayStation in 1994. And GPU, sometimes also called a graphics card, is a chip that performs really rapid calculations for the purpose of rendering images. And this is the type of chip that we need to use for deep learning. And if you imagine a CPU or a normal compute processing unit as a band playing guitars and drums, then a GPU is like a massive audience singing and dancing. Uh, so apart from that reason of building better GPUs, we also have uh, much bigger data. So thousands of images, which are all kept uh, online in a digital format. And these can be accessed now by much faster high capacity storage. And another thing that we also have is improved data privacy. And so in federated learning, this is a concept that was invented by Google and here described by NVIDIA. And in federated learning, a network, a neural network, can be sent to a smart hospital where it can be trained. For example, using images of chest x-rays looking for pneumonia or not. Then the hospital completely retains its own data. But if you remember the weights in our neural network, these are what are sent back to the central provider. And this partially trained network can then be sent to another hospital and another, which allows the network to get better each time. Could it get worse again? Yes, that's possible. So in this field known as computer vision, there are several uh, applications of AI which are coming uh, online in the near future in terms of they're all being trialed at the moment. And uh, so some of them would be like heart health with ECGs, intracranial imaging, diagnoses of stroke, uh, chest X-ray interpretations, retinal imaging, prostate cancer detection of scans, and breast cancer imaging or mammograms. So according to the Royal College of Radiologists, in mammography screening, the NHS is performing around 2 million breast screens for women a year in the UK, and each test result must be reviewed by two clinicians. So the NICE guidelines of January this year for the UK breast screening program are that mammograms should be interpreted by two qualified independent readers. If the two outcomes are different, a third reader or group of readers will arbitrate. Results should be shared within two weeks. Obviously, that is uh, something that's quite important. So if we look at a case study in our digital biology revolution, uh, Mia is a built of convolutional neural networks. And this is an AI from Chiron Medical Technologies. And this has been trained on over 3 million images from multiple sites. And it's undergoing multiple clinical studies across the UK to ensure safety and efficiency. So here is our normal double reading workflow at the top. And with Mia, we have uh, Mia standing in as the second uh, reader in the um, as the first as the second reader sorry <laughs> and if there two readers disagree then this would go to arbitration and i might point out at this stage that the us has a single reader model 
so that AI would first add a double reader to their system. So many women may have missed a screening during lockdown, and so we need to get back on track, and maybe AI could help us uh, speed up our workflows. And if it works really well, maybe in the future, you could actually walk out of your mammogram knowing the answer straight away. So I hope I've convinced you that deep learning gives us some very powerful techniques that can really aid us. We're still ironing out quite a few of the details, and so we need to be really careful in how we apply it at the moment, but the potential is enormous. And if you did do the quiz before, you'll be pleased to know that the three answers, which were all from deep learning, have been chosen as the top three. So everyone guessed. And um, this one that people thought was the least likely was actually said by Ada Lovelace, who is uh, suggested to be the first computer programmer in 1843. And Artificial intelligence will be more profound for humanity than firing in electricity, was said by the CEO of Google in 2017. So uh, thank you very much for listening, and I uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah, really lovely. Uh accessible presentation on the application of AI and particularly in its future application in breast cancer screening. Um, scary thought that at one stage we might have to prove to AI that we're actually humans. That, that, that stood out <laughs> to me. Um, so the, 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 the first question that we have for you this evening is um, as you, just about you as a scientist really. What or who inspired you to study science? Uh, well, I think that would have to be my father, who was actually a scientist himself. So um, mm -hmm. he uh, he was an entomologist, and um, he is very much like David Attenborough, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, the next question for you: Are video gaming tech advances still contributing to the advancement of machine learning? Or has the medical tech accelerated beyond the entertainment industry now? Uh, well, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that they are still very much contributing to the advancement in terms of uh, creating a field where people want better and better GPUs. So, um, and also making them more accessible because uh, they can be quite expensive to use. So uh, I was seeing something yesterday that was suggesting that people would be doing more gaming online and less on consoles coming up. Mm -hmm. So that will presumably make GPUs better accessible and mm -hmm. therefore we'll be able to do more deep learning without um, spending a lot to uh, train our models. Yeah. And a question when you were speaking, you know, uh, the idea that that AI will replace a person, you know, it's always says that a person can pick up things that perhaps a machine wouldn't be programmed to do. I mean, is there any fear of that when we're applying AI to, to screening that, you know, we, we can program a machine to, to pick up everything? Yes, well, I think that's uh, that's definitely why we need to be careful and check um how it's going rather than sort of stem in straight away and say here's the ai and send everybody home we're just going to use the ai um mm. because you know there are problems with bias especially if you train some data on uh, certain types of individuals and then uh, other types of individuals come along and perhaps mm. they haven't been very well represented in the data set so mm. that can be that could be worse and um, yes, yeah, so there's a, a sense that uh, there could be issues there somehow. Yeah. And the last question before we move on, um, in your view, is Mia as accurate as two human reads? So um, would you yes, me so yeah. they, they claim that, that that's what the, uh, the company says, that, um, that the cancer detection rate with 
two humans was 8.4 per thousand and with Mia and one human is 8.5 per thousand mm. um, on the same cases and yeah. they uh, the human and Mia agreed in 81.9 percent of the cases okay. so it is very accurate uh, but we also have to consider the recall rate mm. because uh, the mammography is like a first type of screen. Uh, then you know you'll be recalled for a biopsy or something if you if if something was detected. Obviously, we don't want to miss anything. But mm. if we recalled everybody, we wouldn't miss anything. But that's mm. not the purpose of the screen. So um, so we have to consider the recall rate as well. Brilliant. Yeah, I think we'll move on, Lisa, but thank you very much indeed. That was really fascinating. Thank you. So, everyone, we'll move on to our second presentation this evening, which is given by Dr. Rihanna Lord. Uh, Rihanna is a UK Research Institute leader fellow since February this year. Uh, before that, she was a lecturer in industry in the School of Chemistry at UEA. Um, Rihanna and her group are studying the unique properties of metals to design new drugs to, for the treatment of breast cancer, which will have activity towards cancerous cells, but minimal side effects towards normal cells, a really important point. Uh, and to do this, they're underpinning the drug modes of action within cells. And the overall aim of the research is to improve cancer treatments and minimize any side effects with the ultimate aim of improving the quality of life of cancer patients. So, Rihanna, over to you, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you to the people at Norwich uh, Pine Science for giving me this space to talk to you all today. Um, so, as Anne-Marie already mentioned, my work is um, based around metal-based treatment and drugs, and what I want to try and address is, can they be the future for the treatment of breast cancer? So, just to start, a little bit of information about breast cancer. So um, the breast is made up of three parts. That's the lobes, the ducts, and then the connective tissue around this. And the connective tissue includes everything from the lymph nodes and the vessels. And so we define breast cancer as the result of the uncontrollable cell growth of these breast cells. And these can be benign type tumours where they're located in one area of the breast, or they can be malignant type tumours. And the malignant ones are the most important to look at because these are what we call metathesized, so they, they spread out and they usually spread from the breast through the lymph nodes and the vessels to other areas of the body. And so it's really important to look at these met metastatic cancers because they account for around about 90% of all cancer patient deaths um, resulting from breast cancer. So just uh, some statistics kind of linking to the current um, rates of breast cancer. So around 55,000 cases in the UK, um, these are um, slightly older reports from the Cancer Research UK. And from this, there's around about 11.5 thousand deaths. And I think the most important thing to look at here is um, the ages and the success rates. So, I mean, younger people are also prone to it, but generally it's over 80% um, rates for the people greater, or at least women greater than 45 years of age. And so there has been a huge improvement. So over the last uh, 40 years, we've had a um, improvement in the survival rates. So 40 years back, it was only 40% chance of surviving from breast cancer. And nowadays we're looking at more around 78 to 80% success rates. However, there's still some percentage missing here. So we're not at 100% yet. So I want to address pretty much the remaining 20%. Why aren't we getting 100% survival rates? And also to have a look about some of the preventable cases. So around about 23% of them are preventable. And what I want to kind of address is how can we as scientists achieve this? What can we do? And as Amory said, I'm a structural uh, inorganic chemist, actually. Um, I dabble during my PhD in cell biology, and I'm kind of moving forward now into looking at um, cell culture techniques and 3D models to try and improve um, metal drugs. So just a little milestone of, of where we currently, well, where we came from and where we currently are. So um, back in 3000 to 2500 BC was the first documentation actually of breast cancer. And we've achieved a lot over this time. So we've gone from offerings um, of breast related objects to the Greek gods, to going through surgery, 
to then leaving surgery behind and relying on faith type healing to the revival of surgery. But the most important um, aspect came during the late uh, 1800s. So kind of right at the very end of the 19th century, this was um, where we first saw uh, mastectomies uh, in the clinic. We saw the first use of x-ray treatment or mammograms. And very importantly, we saw the first use of radio treatment. And this was because um, Marie Curie and her husband, Perry, Curie, um, they um, were the first people to kind of, they got the Nobel Prize um, for radioactive elements and they were first used in radio treatments. And actually back in them days, what they actually did was inject directly the radioactive drugs straight into the tumor. So we've progressed a lot since then. We've made some improvements to therapy. We've learned more about the uh, discovery of genes inside the breast cancer, specifically here, the, um, the tumor suppressor type genes. And we've had many FDA approved uh, drugs along the way. It's important to note these FDA approved drugs so far to date have been either based on uh, proteins or small organic molecules, and nothing to date has been done on metallic uh, metal based drugs. So what I want to address here is all of these um, compounds that have been FDA approved. I mean, many of them are very good at treating um, what I classify here as normal cancer. So that kind of 80 percent of cancers which are treatable, but the 20 percent which are more aggressive type cancers, um, a lot of these clinical drugs fail to treat. So what my area of interest is in is these aggressive forms of cancer. So I'll just introduce um, one type of these. So one of the most aggressive types of cancer is called triple negative breast cancer. It's triple negative because, um, so I've, they're labeled here as E, P and H. These are the genes. So estrogen, progesterone and the human um, hormone genes. And they're negative for all of these. And this unfortunately makes them really um, non-susceptible to a lot of treatments. So they're very hard to treat. And as I said, these are around about the, the remaining 15 to 20% of breast cancers. They're poorly diagnosed and they have really bad uh, survival rates. And it's important to note here that the reoccurrence is, a, is much greater than those. So the ER is the estrogen uh, receptor. So those that are positive for an estrogen receptor um, or the other 80% of cancers are relatively, um, the recurrence rates are much lower. And so what I want to address is why are the reoccurrence? So we'll find out in the next slide about possibilities of the reoccurrence. So the current treatment for these triple negative breast cancers usually is a, what we call combination therapy. So this involves usually first surgery to remove most of the breast tissue, um, then usually a round of chemotherapy or sometimes chemotherapy and radiation therapy together. And what's important to note for my research is kind of what we, what we call these cells that are left behind. So as I said, the reoccurrence rates are much higher and that's usually because most of the cells can't be treated. So we have some cells that remain inside the breast tissue that cause regrowth and relapse. And most of these cells that remain have uh, what we call uh, morphology changes in them. And this is due to what we know as hypoxia. So this is low oxygen concentration. So just an introduction to this and this links in with um, the aims of, of my research. So here is a, a description or a schematic of, of a type of tumor. So the kind of outside, the purpley red areas on the outside are what we call the normal tumor cells or non-moxic environments. And these receive a high amount of blood supply. So because they receive a high amount of blood supply, they're very high in oxygen concentration. And these we can quite easily treat with most uh, chemotherapy and radiation treatments. Unfortunately, these in the core here, these are called hypoxic cells, and these don't have a very good blood supply. So they generally have low oxygen concentration and these are hard to treat. So these are what kind of remain behind after treatment. And if they remain behind, they cause uh, regrowth and relapse. So because all of the treatment so far has been looking at um, small organic molecules, my area is going to be looking at metal based treatments, ideally ones that are cheap, ready, readily available. We want to use metals that are non toxic to the body. And ideally what we want to do is try and cause some activation. Um, so what I mean by this is switching on an activity. So in introducing a drug that's non-toxic and having it switch on an activity inside the cells. And this will allow us to target and selectively target cancer cells and minimize side effects to patients. So I'm going to briefly just say why metals. Um, so this is the periodic table for those who are non-chemists and don't really know the periodic table well. I'm just going to highlight a few areas that are of interest. So up here in blue in the top corner, 
are what we classify. I mean, there, there is more of them, but generally the organic uh, elements, which most um, small molecule organics are made of. We have here over this side um, some metal salts, which are known. Uh, for example, sodium is an electrolyte important in the nervous system um, and many others. What's important for my research is the transition metals. So these in blue in the middle are all the transition metals. And specifically, the first row transition metals here highlighted. And this is because these are readily found in the body. For example, we have iron found in hemoglobin, responsible for oxygen transport. And we have cobalt, uh, which is the metal found in vitamin B12. However, most cancer drugs, if you look around metal-based treatments, are based on platinum, which is a heavy element. And we don't really want to be using these because they are already toxic to the body. So my area of research will look at these two elements here, uh, vanadium, which I'll introduce in more detail, and iron. So as I said, metal-based drugs have already been used in the clinic. Uh, these are three well-known platinum-based drugs. I said platinum is a heavy metal, so we don't really want to put it in the body. But platinum has been well used in a range of cancer treatments. So it's got very high success rates for treating other cancers. But to date, it's still not used in the clinic for the treatment of triple negative breast cancers. So what I want to do is kind of look at the introduction of metals and very briefly show you some results of ours. So I think on the first, uh, on the milestone slide, I showed um, the FDA approved drugs. One of them was a drug known as tamoxifen. This is a slight modification called hydroxytamoxifen. Uh, the structure is not really that important for those who don't know the chemical structures, but this is important. So this blue organic molecule here that I've shown, um, if you switch that out for a metal drug, so here is iron, what you can do here, so this um, organic molecule is not able to treat triple negative breast cancer. And by inserting an iron molecule into this, we can now treat triple negative breast cancer. So it shows adding metals to already known drugs can improve their selectivity. As I said for us, vanadium is very important. Um, it's really cheap. We already have it in the body, so there's less uh, than one milligram in the body, but it's there. You ingest it, um, if you eat the certain foods, you'll ingest it every day in, in certain foods. I mean, even in America and China, they now substitute their cereals and things with added uh, vanadium. But the mechanisms are really unknown. Nobody really knows what it's for in the body, what it does. So I want to look at the um, the different environments of the vanadium specifically, and I won't go into too much detail about it, but the oxidation states. And this is because with inside cells, as I said, uh, these hypoxic conditions, we have low oxygen. We can oxidize and reduce the vanadium center inside the cells. Um, so just coming up to the end of the talk, I just want to introduce just two slides on the results that we've got so far and hopefully I can convince you that they are uh, working. So as I said, normoxic conditions, these are normal oxygen conditions. I've labeled them here as their um, abbreviations. So this is cis platin, oxalic platin, and carboplatin. These are the platinum-based drugs. The smaller the, um, the bar, the more active they are. So cis platin and oxalic platin are very good against most cancers. Um, you don't need to worry too much about the cancer types, but the important one is the pink one here. This is the triple negative breast cancer. The yellow one is actually the one that's positive for estrogen. And we have an, or vanadium here. Again, the structure is not too important, but vanadium is also very active in normoxic conditions. But the important thing for us is in hypoxia. So as soon as we go to low oxygen concentration, all of these platinum-based drugs switch off their activity. So they're on, we consider these to be non-toxic. However, our vanadium actually increases its activity specifically towards triple negative breast cancer. So we're able here to switch on some form of activity. So these are very preliminary results. They're not published anywhere yet. So we've got a lot of work to do in this field, but hopefully I can convince you that adding metals into drugs can improve, especially metals that are non-toxic to the body anyway, can improve their um, activities. And that leaves me to just to thank, uh, to wrap up the, the people along the way. So um, starting from my, my PhD at the University of Leeds, all the way through now to um, the UKRI, who's funded me for uh, the work on vanadium and especially for the pints of science for giving me the, the space to talk to you all tonight uh, and i'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any thank you so much uh, yeah and a really clear presentation and just huge huge potential your work so good luck with it all and um, we'll pose you a few questions before you run off if that's okay sure. um the first question is um 
which has been the eureka moment of your career? Have you ever sat down one night and thought that was a good day in my career? Um, I think this was going to be my future leader fellowship. So I've been trying so hard, especially to get people from medicinal sciences or pharmacology to try and see the potential in metals. Mm. Um, they shy away from them. So when you talk to people, they only really like organic molecules because we know what's mm. happening with the organic yeah. molecules. And to try and, and when I got the fellowship, it was it was a breakthrough moment because actually people were realizing the potential of the metals. So the, the UK yeah. RI fellowship, um, I won just short of a million pounds to conduct this research. Yeah. So it was a, a light bulb moment for metal-based treatment, I think. Fabulous. Um, getting on to the biology, uh, how many different types of breast cancer are there, do you know? You're yes, talking so about the triple negative tonight, but there are many others, aren't there? Yeah, so there's, there's seven different types of um, breast cancer. Um, these usually are named depending on their location. So you have um, mm. ones that, for example, are located in the, the lobes, or um, the one that obviously I was talking about was triple negative, which is the most aggressive types of cancer. So in total, there's seven, but they do form in, in fall into, sorry, into subsets as well. Um, and that depends on the type of cell. So this is what we call a basal type um, cell. But yeah, there's, there's seven known um, cancers or breast cancers. Brilliant. And you were talking about vanadium. I mean, is, is vanadium type treatment suitable, likely to be suitable for all cancers or is it, is, is, it, is it likely to be specifically effective against breast cancers? That's a good point. I mean, so we, we when we make these, we do screen against all cancers to try and find some hits. Mm -hmm. And it is well known, actually, that vanadiums or vanadate, vanadates, the highest oxidation state vanadium, um, mm -hmm. locates inside the bone. So I am working as well on separate projects on looking at whether we can specifically locate our compounds in bone cancers. Um, they have, so any, anywhere that has kind of high phosphate concentrations, the vanadates can mimic the potential of phosphates. Um, so I think they're already used um, in the treatment of diabetes as well, uh, vanadium. So there's already some patented work on diabetes. So I think they have a huge potential across a lot of fields, but very under understudied. Great. I think we'll sneak in one more question, if we may. Um, given the issues with rare metal mining at the moment, are they easily obtained? So vanadium is, yes. So some of the other ones, not. Um, I think that's quite obvious in the prices. So as the last time I looked, I think, for example, platinum-based drugs, um, you probably pay around about £2,000 per 100 gram of platinum. Mm -hmm. And for vanadium, you pay about £18. Um, so it's really yeah. easy, accessible. And I think that this was a lot of the selling point for working on vanadium and trying to move away from precious metal drugs. Yeah, yeah. yeah vanadium is very easily to obtain. Yeah. yeah. And we will actually sneak in one more because it's a yeah, great sure. question. <laughs> uh, are there any potential side effects? You know, is, is there any toxicity issues? Yeah, this, this comes with, um, I mean, we don't know much about vanadium, how it exits the body yet there's not been too much done on it yeah. so it depends whether you get start getting a build-up because obviously if you're using this as a chemotherapy treatment you'll be having regular treatment and if the metal isn't being excreted from the body well enough you will yeah. likely get a build-up of that metal in the body and that's yeah. where the toxicity issues come in so until we yeah. find out the full um how it metabolizes properly in the body and, ex mm -hmm. and is excreted yeah there there could be i mean that's the issue with platinum-based drugs anyway um yeah you know, is the yeah. build-up of proxies too. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Rihanna, and best of luck with it all. Thank you very much. So, folks, I'll um, quickly move on to our last speaker of this evening, who is Nancy Tang. Nancy is a PhD student in Norwich. Um, she studied a BSc in, in biomedicine at UEA. Then she left Norwich to pursue an MSc in immunology and infection, infectious diseases at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London. Uh, and during her formative studies, she developed a particular interest in the gut microbiota and how it can influence the immune system. Um, currently, Nancy is, as I mentioned, doing a PhD funded by a local charity called The Big C. And she's exploring a very exciting topic, actually, exploring the relationship between the gut microbiota and breast health in humans. So Nancy, we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say and over to you. Cheers, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. My name is Nancy and I'm a third year PhD student based at the Quadrant Institute in Norwich, UK. And 
Today, I'll be giving you essentially a very brief overview of the background behind my PhD project, which is actually a project between two different labs. So my primary supervisor, Stephen Robinson, specializes in breast cancer research. I'm a secondary supervisor, Lindsay Hall, who specializes in gut microbiota research. And hopefully at the end of uh, this talk, I can convince you how the gut microbiota may actually be related to breast health, um, and more specifically the disease breast cancer. But without further ado, I'll just start. So as you've heard from our previous speakers, breast cancer is a disease that affects so many women um, within the UK and actually also globally. So it isn't necessarily surprising that it is in fact the leading cause of cancer related illnesses in women globally. Every year, 8.6 million new cases of cancer is diagnosed in women, and a quarter of which is just breast cancer alone, which is a staggering amount. Although breast cancer is predominantly diagnosed in women, there are a very small number of men that are actually diagnosed with breast cancer each year, just showing that this disease doesn't necessarily discriminate between genders. So this graph over here is taken from Cancer Research UK, and Anne-Marie touched on this, and it basically shows the relative five-year survival rate based on the point of diagnosis. And the relative survival rate is actually really good, and around 85% when you're diagnosed at stage two, and perhaps 55% when you're diagnosed at stage three. But then it suddenly drops, and actually drops quite dramatically, down to 15% when you're diagnosed at stage four, also known as the metastatic stage. Therefore, by understanding factors that drive disease progression in breast cancer could hopefully improve patient outcomes. But there's also a economic incentive why we should focus our efforts onto breast cancer research as the cost of treatment relative to stage one doubles once patients reach stage three. And this is driven mainly due to greater resource utilization. Therefore, understanding factors about breast cancer, its disease and its progression would benefit not only our patients, but also our national healthcare system. Now, going back to the disease, there are several risk factors associated with breast cancer. Roughly 10% of the reported cases are actually due to a genetic factor. A very famous example would be the BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes. And carrying a mutation in either of these genes significantly increases your risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer later in life. But there are several non-genetic risk factors associated with breast cancer, and these are hormones, alcohol, obesity, sorry, obesity, alcohol, hormones, diet, and heavy and consecutive antibiotic use early in life. Now, something that all of these risk factors have in common, apart from genetics, is that they all severely impact the gut microbiota. And when I talk about the gut microbiota, I'm specifically referring to the bacteria that normally reside in an individual's gut. And in the last decade or so, the gut microbiota has gained a lot of interest, not only within the scientific community, but also within the public community. Because people are realizing more and more that the gut microbiota can actually influence health as well as disease. And I'll just list a few of the examples um, of the points why the gut microbiota is so um, important to us here. So the first um, point I would like to highlight is the fact that the gut microbiota and the bacteria within the gut actually naturally interact with the gut lining. And this actually strengthens the barrier, something we call barrier integrity. And having a very strong barrier is just like having a very strong dam. It prevents things from coming through, which is actually a really good thing because the gut's essentially a very hostile environment. There are good bacteria, granted, but they're also quite bad bacteria. There are byproducts, there's a bit of stomach acid in there, all of those things we really do not want in our blood because that could make us ill. So having that very strong barrier by the natural interaction with the bacteria is a great thing for us. The second reason is probably the most famous reason why the gut microbiota is well known across the world, and this is due to the fact that it helps with digestion. So there are bacteria that are incredibly picky eaters, just like our toddlers, and, and when they find something they really, really like, they break it down and they produce certain products. And these products are called metabolites. And, and in the last few years, metabolites have been shown to be quite beneficial in terms of influencing um, different aspects within the body. So a very good example would be bacteria that preferentially digest um, dietary fiber. Examples of dietary fiber are oats and wholemeal pasta. So when a bacteria finds dietary fiber, it eats it all up, it breaks it down, and produces something called short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids have been shown to be anti-inflammatory, which is great for localized inflammatory conditions, for example, colitis, which is um, inflammation of the gut. And so having short-chain fatty acids within the gut is great against colitis, but more research is currently undergoing to see how short-chain fatty acids actually affects the rest of the body against other inflammatory conditions and even conditions like cancer. So that's something very, I guess, exciting to look forward to in the future. 
And the last point I would like to highlight is that the gut microbiota has been shown to influence the immune system. Now, scientists have developed these mice called germ-free mice, and as their name suggests, these mice have never seen a germ in their life. So this essentially means that they're born sterile and they don't actually have a gut microbiota. So when scientists looked at the, these mice and specifically looked at their cells and their immune cells, they noticed it behaved really oddly. It wasn't really behaving as it was expecting to. Um, and they pondered about this observation and basically they concluded that perhaps the gut microbiota, because it is present so early in life, may actually educate the immune system in some way or form and actually know that this bacteria doesn't make us sick and actually it helps the body. So we're going to keep it compared to this bacteria, which made us really, really sick for a week. So we need to get rid of it as quickly as possible. And these are just a few reasons to see how the gut microbiota can actually work in our favor. And by understanding the gut microbiota and see how it influences us and more specifically our health and disease could provide new insights into therapies or even diagnostic tools. Now, traditionally, we are told that bacteria are bad for us. They are germs and it causes diseases. And this is kind of true to a certain extent. And there are certain bacteria that have been found to increase your risk of developing certain types of cancer. A very famous example is Helicobacter pylori in the uh, initiation of stomach cancer or Fusobacterium nucleatum in the initiation of gut cancer. And there are so many other studies supporting this observation that indeed bacteria can cause cancer. But I would like to convince you otherwise. I would like to shed bacteria in a good light, so to speak, and not necessarily give them the bad rep. As I mentioned before, there are, um, the gut microbiota has been shown to influence the immune system. More research to date has now suggested that one of the ways it can do this is actually by influencing immune checkpoints. And immune checkpoints basically are border control points for your immune system to check in with itself and make sure that the cells it is activating and targeting are actually the correct ones. Because if you have rogue cells that are attacking healthy tissue, that'd be quite bad for us. Now, cancer research have actually taken advantage of these immune checkpoints and they've developed these therapies called immunotherapies that essentially uses the host immune system to find and target cancer cells and destroy them, which is a pretty cool thing in itself, but I won't delve into that. Now, when clinicians gave immunotherapies to their patients, they noticed that some of these patients responded really, really well, which was amazing news, but others didn't really respond at all. And there didn't seem to be a very obvious explanation um, until someone suggested, well, maybe we can't see it because they are small. They are so tiny because they are actually in our gut. And lo and behold, when they actually delved deeper into the gut microbiota profiles of these patients, they noticed that those who responded really well tended to have really specific strains or a group of specific bacteria in their gut microbiota compared to those who did not. Now, this is exciting news because essentially you could influence the outcome of immunotherapies just by tweaking the gut microbiota slightly. But unfortunately, most of the studies today looking into this relationship tended to focus on either skin cancer or gut cancer. Little studies have been done on other cancers, let alone what about breast cancer? Because as we've been repeating, this entire evening, it affects so many women all across the world. Now I know what you may be thinking, gut microbiota and gut cancer kind of make sense because anatomically they're literally next to each other, whereas breast tissue and the gut microbiota are a bit far apart. Now I'm hoping that this figure would convince you how I believe that there might be a relationship. So this is a figure taken from a study published in 2018, and this group collected a lot of data and a lot of um, microbiota data of the Twins UK cohort. And they basically chucked all that data into a computer, politely asked the computer, could you please calculate the statistically significant associations between the gut microbiota and common diseases and prescription medications? And this is the outcome of it. Now, it seems like a lot, but most importantly, breast cancer, as highlighted here, showed up as having a significant relationship. This figure essentially means that breast cancer patients do indeed have a significantly different gut microbiota profile than those who do not have breast cancer. Although this wasn't further investigated in this particular study, it does beg the question, can the gut microbiota perhaps be predictive or causal for breast cancer? And this is a question that scientists all across the world are actually believing could be a genuine relationship and are trying to address. So, these are screenshots taken from clinicaltrials.gov. I basically typed in the two keywords, gut microbiota and breast cancer. Um, and these are just a few of the 30, um, as you can see on screenshots. Uh, 
these are just a few of the 30 registered trials currently trying to find out if there is or trying to figure out what the link between the gut microbiota and breast cancer is because the answer to this could essentially be used as a tool for diagnostics so instead of me to go into a mammogram you could have a robust signature or perhaps it could improve diagnostics or either it could be used as a tool for therapy knowing if you can respond better to a certain therapy versus others and this is a very exciting part to be the topic to be a part of because we're literally just scratching the surface of this really exciting relationship and this is something that my supervisors Lindsay and Stephen wanted to join in on too so just to end this talk with I'd like to briefly introduce you to my PhD project also known as the beam study and the beam study is a pro is a study primarily based at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and I'll be asking my patients to donate fecal blood and tissue samples these I'll use to hopefully profile the gut microbiota of these patients and actually correlate them to clinical outcomes, see if there is a pattern within the microbiota and if that resulted into any specific outcome. Should you have more um, questions, you can ask me now. Alternatively, if you just wanna read more about the study, there's a website here about the BEAM study. If you have recruitment specific questions, please feel free to email, <coughs> email my partners at NRP Biorepository, who have been an absolute legend in helping me set up the study. But with that, and uh, that's the end of my talk. I'd really like to thank you for listening. I'd love to thank the members of the Hall and Robinson Lab for without them. I probably wouldn't be as sane as I am now, although I know that's still questionable. The staff of the biorepository, the QIB sequencing team, the lovely consultants and nurses at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital, my amazing sponsor, the Big C, for without them, I wouldn't be able to do this research. And obviously, Pint of Science for giving me this amazing platform to share my research with all of you. But yeah, thank you so much for listening. Nancy, thank you. That was great. Really clear, really informative. Um, right, we have some questions for you. Uh, the first question is, do cancer patients take antibiotics to protect from infection during treatments? And so I'm not a clinician, but um, as far as I'm aware, they do take prophylactic antibiotics when they do have to undergo surgery, because obviously um, getting a, an, an infection is probably... Mm -hmm. Bad. so you want to try and prevent that absolutely yeah um slight, slightly different type of question now how do you keep mice germ free very good question <laughs> i unfortunately don't have any experience with that but my yeah. guess is you try to just keep it as sterile as possible i know that yeah. a lot of effort goes into these um germ-free facilities and it's literally just like you get hosed down before you come in you need yeah. to be wear suits and everything like that to really prevent any germs coming into the facility where the mice are housed. Yeah, that's right. I think it's really, really rigorous protocols, isn't it? Yeah, to do yeah, it well. Probably. Sorry, yeah. I, I can't yeah. really answer that question better. No, no, yeah, you answered it perfectly. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> um, is it sensible to take Yakult types of drinks? So the whole thing about probiotics and prebiotics, what's, what's your view on those? Ooh. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian or anything like that, just mm. like to dis disclaim that. Um, I personally think it's, it's okay because it, it doesn't necessarily do any harm in taking them. Otherwise, it wouldn't be sold. Um, so if you like the taste of it, if it thinks it helps you because it can, uh, then by all means, just continue enjoying the drink. I do like a yeah. yakult. <laughs> Um, and the last is a different type of question. Again, it's about uh, fecal transplants. Uh, articles talk about maybe using fecal transplants for IBS, irritable bowel syndrome and other diseases. Is that something you might think about in the treatment of cancer in the future? Um, so I think there was a paper that was published maybe last year where they actually gave a fecal um, transplant to patients who was do, who who had the one of the immunotherapies that I mentioned in the, in the um, talk, and they mm. gave a fecal microbiota transplant of those who responded to those who didn't respond, mm. and they did actually see a respond after the um, FMTs. So it could mm. potentially be used. I think it was still in a very early trial, so I think they only used like mm. three, three or five patients. Um, yeah. But it's, it is very promising if you think about it. And yeah. whether or not it might apply to breast cancer, yeah. that is. Um, Ask me that again in 20 years. 
Great. It's it's a really exciting time actually to be working in the gut microflora field. It it seems to influence so many aspects of health. It really does. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so Nancy, I think in the interest of time, we'll finish there. So thank you very much again, and um, I'll just wrap up by saying thank you to our three speakers, Lisa, Rianne and Nancy, for three very, very informative talks. Uh, I hope you, the audience, found our talks informative but also entertaining, hopefully. Uh, we are going to bring up a slide now with a Mentimeter poll. Um, and that's just, if you wouldn't mind, just, just uh, conducting that survey for us. It's just to, to figure out how much you learn the course of the evening it shouldn't take long just five questions i believe so we'd really appreciate if you took the time to do that and also a pint of science in the description box and youtube have a, a brief questionnaire which i believe there's some prizes to be won uh, just again to provide some feedback on this evening so uh, i think we'll leave it there if you have any questions at all on any elements of the talk please do get in touch we'll, we'll, we'll answer you as quickly as we can and just take care and uh, yeah, hope to see you virtually or in person soon again. Okay, good evening everyone, bye bye.